we're beginning to service outside. Um, Out on the patio outside, thank you, Phil, um, and under the trees, uh, with the uh, blessing of the palms and the, um, and the donkey that will lead a procession around to the front of the church. So um, if you're wondering where I am and where everybody else is, that's where I am and where everybody else is, is we're starting outside. Um, so if you'd like to join us in that outside procession, you're certainly welcome to do that, or you can wait for us to get back here as well. You'll hear the choir start singing a chant, calling everybody in. When you hear that chant, you can sing along. It's printed in your service leaflet as we call everybody in and we make that holy procession. Um, and also, as we make our way in, we'll get ourselves situated in here, and then we'll continue with our, our formal entrance procession with, um, with our entrance hymn as well. And that's um, all glory, Lord, and honor hymn 154. So I'm here to say I'll see you in a minute. Um, and join in when you hear the singing.
And we pray, Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and of peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Remaining standing, let us sing together hymn 154. Verse 1, 2, and 3, all glory, laud, and honor. Oh! 
sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us an example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the next lesson. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, and I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting, the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. And therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please turn to page 4 in your service bulletin or page 622 in the prayer book. Join me in reciting Psalm 31, verses 9 through 16, by responding in half verse. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eyes consume with sorrow, and also my throat to my mouth. For my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies, and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. I am forgotten like a dead man, out of mind. I am useless a broken rock. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, and fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They they plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies, and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. And in your loving kindness say it.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. For they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heaven. In the name of God, Father, Son, Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Can you feel it? Can you feel that little kind of weird shift we just did. We did. We did a weird shift. We turned just subtly. We began the service outside crying Hosanna. And we followed a wonderful donkey. Remind me the name. Jack. And there's a little horse out there too. Little bit. And we watched kids ride the horse and the donkey, Jack, in little bit. And by the way, I hope they're riding some now. They'll be here until 11.30. If you guys want to go all go out and ride a donkey or a horse, you're welcome to go do that. I get it. And then we sang triumphantly as we came in. Thank you, choir, for calling us into the church, for teaching us the song that we all sang together. And we, and we rejoiced. And we, we entered this church with this feeling of lightness. And then, did you feel it? Like, it shifted. <clears throat> We didn't have the the normal song that we sing for Lent. We've been fasting from things, and we fasted from that song we sing before and after the gospel, so there is a silent walk. And I don't know about you, but that reading from Mark, the gospel lesson I just read, that's a shift. That's a change. Things begin with rejoicing this day, and they turn to being very serious. Let me just preface the next part by saying this. At All Saints, we are going to follow the Gospel of Mark all the way through Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday, and it's Palm Sunday, and often called in many traditions Passion Sunday. I don't know about your tradition, but many might read the Passion reading on Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week. But our tradition here is to leave that Passion reading until Passion Friday or Good Friday. We try to follow along the events 
of Holy Week piece by piece by piece. In doing so, we've been guided by a teaching from from a number of biblical scholars, one of which I'll read some notes from in just a moment, inviting us to take Holy Week as a step-by-step unfolding of a dramatic story. Mark, the Gospel of Mark, I think does this especially well. And in this church year, we are reading the Gospel of Mark primarily. So you'll hear Mark read as these services unfold tomorrow and then Tuesday and Wednesday and then Thursday and then Friday. And then we'll hear Mark again when we come to the Resurrection Day on Sunday, on Easter Day. Hearing this wonderful, efficient, very focused storyteller in the Gospel of Mark. But today, here we are. We've just entered Jerusalem triumphantly. And I love the little note that it says that Jesus walks into the temple, looks around, and then goes back out of the city to go to bed, which is pretty great. It's like arriving at a really, really big city, driving through downtown, and then saying, I'm sleepy, driving back to your hotel about 20 minutes away. That almost is exactly as it unfolded. The next day, though, things get very, very serious indeed. But let's set some context. Let's remind ourselves of where we are, because as I say many times, context is important, important, but also understanding a bit of the context, particularly of Holy Week, is helpful. Remember that we're hearing the story of an occupied people. This is a people who are living under occupation. This is a time period known in Judaism as, as Second Temple Judaism about a 600-year period stretching from the time when the Jews came back from their exile in Babylon, when the people of Israel were allowed to rebuild the great temple that had been destroyed in about 6th century B.C. And rebuilding that temple was a signal that, that, that their heritage and their identity and the identity of their grandparents, but also the identity of their grandchildren can have this great linkage. It's a cause of great celebration Even still, however, even though they were rebuilding that temple and were successful in in being present in the holy city Jerusalem and in what remained of their kingdom of Judah, the people of Israel still lived, lived under foreign occupation. That foreign occupation went through a number of transitions. And in the midst of that foreign occupation, there are some periodic revolts. The Maccabean revolt, some 200 years before Jesus' time, was modestly successful. It's the stuff of great legend and great celebration even today. And it resulted in some modest freedom for the people of Israel. Under, though, still Roman rule. And while that Maccabean revolt period assured some sense of self-determination, things consistently went sideways ever since. At the time of Jesus, that sideways drift had come after a series of insurrections pressing against the dominating influence and cultural influence of Rome. The people of Israel continuing to struggle as a people oppressed, a people unfairly treated. And also, in addition to the oppression that they felt in their lives and in their civic lives, their religious lives, their faith lives were deeply affected. And the power and influence of of Roman ideas and religious practice continued to seep into Judaism, opening not only civic and political rifts, but also religious and cultural rifts within Judaism itself. And if you read the Gospels carefully, you can see signs of those rifts. These various groups, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, have all special interests that that are aligning themselves. And the unity that was once celebrated, or at least in the scriptures is celebrated, of the people of Israel is increasingly fragmented. That's what happens to a people who have lived under oppression for so long. That fear has a way of settling into every part of life. Disputes were numerous, and Jesus was walking in the midst of a significant series of disputes at his time. This long-term collective trauma of occupation and continual revolt and then suppression, this long-term trauma of domination by an outside empire, left long-term generational effects. 
long patterns of violence and pressure of all kinds, was then compounded by the current events of Jesus' time. Signs and symbols and threats of more and more violence that was at the very gates and at the doorstep of the very people of Israel of Jesus' time. One of the ways in which insurrections were put down under Rome was by the systematic torture and killing of the people who were rising up against that power, placing them on a wooden cross outside of civic spaces in the entrances to towns or in public squares so that they may be, they may be shown to be the insurrectionists they were and that the people would be reminded to never, ever revolt. Can you imagine the trauma it would cause you and me to come across such a sight in our own life? This long-term trauma, this re-traumatizing over and over and over again, of course, left its mark in the hearts, minds, and spirits of the people these public displays were most prominent around the time of Passover. Passover, the yearly celebration of the liberation of the people of Israel from the hands of oppression in Egypt. The reminder that God's promise to Israel is enduring and that God has done miraculous things to free the people of Israel from oppression. You can imagine the excitement around Passover celebrations hoping for and yearning for one more deliverance, this deliverance that had come in the past and might come once more. And the energy around Passover among the people of Israel gathered in Jerusalem was a deep and existential threat to the powers of Rome and also to the people of Israel who were colluding with Rome, trying to keep the peace. The temple priests did not like that this insurrection might rise up and make things insecure. Rome's power and willingness to set down rebellion is legendary. It's in this context, then, that Jesus and his friends appear on the outside of Jerusalem. At the same time that Jesus and his friends would be entering into one gate, at the other main gate of Jerusalem, there would be demonstrations of Roman power and superiority, making their way into the places where they would take up stations and show that they are indeed in charge. And here I pick up from the book I mentioned earlier, or the authors I mentioned earlier, John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg, in their wonderful book, The Last Week. I would write that down if I were you. The Last Week. It's a day-by-day telling of the account according to the Gospel of Mark. And here they write... Jesus' procession that day deliberately countered what was going on, what was happening on the other side of the city. Roman leader Pontius Pilate's procession embodied the power and the glory and the violence of an empire that ruled the entire world. Jesus' procession embodied an alternative version, a vision of the kingdom of God. This contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Caesar is central not only to the gospel of Mark, but to the entire story of Jesus and of all of Christianity. And the confrontation, they continue to say, between these two kingdoms continues through the last week of Jesus' life. We know how the week ends with Jesus' execution by the powers who rule the world. Holy week, here, our holy week, is the unfolding of the story of this confrontation. Put in another way, this work of Jesus coming into Jerusalem in this way, particularly in the Gospel of Mark, looks very similar, if not eerily similar, to what today we would call a protest march. Jesus has planned ahead, go find a donkey, and instead of a great big horse like Rome would bring in, a horse that is beautiful in its, in its preparation and adorned with, with wonderful um, armor and protection, Jesus says, go find a donkey, and it's not even a donkey he owns. It's a donkey on the wayside of a street, a borrowed donkey. And he doesn't even steal it. He gives it back 
Mark's very particular about that, as are the other gospel writers. Go borrow a donkey from the side of the street from somebody that you happen to meet and let them know that the master needs it. What a non-professional procession this is turning out to be. Standing on this donkey, this sign of a beast of burden, this unruly beast of the fields, Jesus then rides the donkey in, and instead of the the great banners of power and the great swords and the great spears that would be be flanking a a royal procession, uh, there are palm branches and stuff that people cut out from the fields that are waved. And then instead of having somebody pressed into service or pressed into slavery to sweep and clean the streets, perfect streets made with perfectly laid bricks, to clean out any dirt from the street so that that royal procession can come in on the perfect street. Jesus' procession is on a dirt path covered with whatever the people had with them as they willingly laid down, having their own agency, not pressed into service by the blade of a soldier, but willingly having agency to lie down their own cloaks as this king rides in to Jerusalem. This is a very different kind of procession. This alternative version of what it means to live and reign in the midst of God's gracious kingdom. This is our entry into Holy Week. This profound entry of Jesus of Nazareth, which is the alternative version of the power that might accompany a powerful resurrection, a powerful Insurrection is a reminder that Jesus' way of countering the powers and principalities of the world is very different indeed. There were, in the time of Jesus, numerous armed revolts, the likes of which looked a lot like Roman-style revolts. Those revolts resulted in the same thing they always had and always do continual and consistent patterns of more and more violence, more and more loss of life, and nothing really changes. The full and utter demonstration of this pattern of armed revolt as the way to resist the powers and principalities of the world and the futility of that path was demonstrated in 70 AD by the final revolt of the people of Israel in the ultimate and complete destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the loss of Israel of a homeland, a loss that was not recovered for some two millennia. Jesus is telling us something here powerfully about what it means to live in the kingdom of God. When we live in the kingdom of God, we will have to acknowledge that the way that God understands and seeks to run and rule the world is not the same as you and I might choose following the lesser instincts of ourselves. Using the tools of armed domination, of political influence and economic power, we might win everything. But the people of God ruling that way, living that way, might lose the very thing that is most important which is the dwelling place deep within our hearts, a dwelling place that is so expansive that in the midst of the hands of Jesus of Nazareth, all are welcome, even those with whom we have great disagreement. This counter-narrative of Jesus of Nazareth, this idea of welcoming all into the arms of love, this idea of welcoming even those with whom we might have the most deep lasting generational dispute into the embrace of divine promise and divine life is perhaps the most countercultural and, in his time, the most dangerous thing one could say. Jesus' vision for the kingdom, as he describes it, the reign of God, is not defined by political power, economic might, or military domination. It is defined by an abiding, deep, lasting transformation of each and every person and all of creation 
this reconciliation of all things, we say. Jesus of Nazareth is interested in no, no less than God's entire love, life, and presence to be radically felt, experienced, and lived in every space of our lives, not in one way, not by one people, but by all people in the midst of wonderful, spectacular, even puzzling diversity of people, that this love might be true and real. He was courageous enough to say so, perhaps careless enough to demonstrate it, and willing to continue to preach it to the very end. And he calls us to the same. In this way, then, the triumphal entry that we celebrate today is not only a triumphal entry into a historic place, and love a good story that I do. It's not out there. It's not a movie I can watch, a book I can read. It's not something that I can say happened and may happen again. It's actually a triumphal entry into perhaps the most well-protected fortress of solitude there truly is, which is my own heart and your own heart that carefully guarded place that Christ continually seeks to enter in, that carefully guarded fortress that we erect around ourselves and that I am so willing to defend with my own very life. This truly, perhaps, is the passage into Holy Week, that only when lives are transformed outward and inward and inward and outward and repeating all over again, inner life and outer life, repeating that all over again. Only when lives are truly transformed can we truly begin to see the possibility of what that triumphal entry might really have. That there is no power that can mute the power of God's love. There is no death that can die God's love. There is no death in which God's love is not present. There is no separation. There is no height, no depth, no valley so deep, so far away that we are away from God's love. And truly knowing that profound experience might just transform us into the people whom Christ is calling us to be, who might fully be free from any power, from any domination and that might seek the freedom, the true freedom of all. Welcome to this sacred, profound, and I'm just going to say it, puzzling and sometimes dangerous journey of Holy Week. Opening your life to the presence of Christ anew, and to the power of love and the durability of God's grace is a risky thing. It's this journey that Jesus enters into this week and calls us to open ourselves to the rest of our lives. Thanks be to God. Continuing our journey, proclaiming together the faith that the church has called us into, I invite you to stand, and if you're so inclined, to join with me in proclaiming the Nicene Creed. It's printed in your service bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, who through him all things were made. For us.
us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son, she is worshipped and glorified. She has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found in your service bulletin. Standing, sitting, or kneeling, let us pray. I ask your prayers for the church in its many forms throughout the world. For all who gather for prayer, instruction, nourishment, and healing. For faithful leaders, including David, our bishop, Michael, our presiding bishop, and Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and for all ministers and leaders. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. I ask your prayers especially for the people of Israel and Palestine and the people of Ukraine. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. For the sick, including Jean Chatham, Wayne Dunkel, Deborah Haven, George Finley, Rich Will, Jennifer Frizzell, Sally Daly, Jackie Lee Rock, Rochelle Payne, <coughs> Emily Flores, Bishop Michael Curry, Lily Longoria, Sam Wolf. Trey Molina, Kathy Cole Perez, Gracie Magallan, and, Greg, and Gary Markham. For those who are recovering and healing from injury and illness, including Jennifer Wickham, Diane Gottlich, George Hutchinson, and Carolyn and Skip Stout. We pray for those who are homebound or in long-term care, including Ramiro Lopez and Sally Daly. We pray for those serving in the military, including Noah Hinoosa, Ethan Fish, Miles McDonald, Shane Weinstock, Derek and Julia Haven, Scott Rohde, Carlos Trevino, Tyrone Hubbard, Olivia Ramsey, and Nathaniel Hinoosa and their families who watch, wait, and worry. Pray for those in need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God's presence. I ask your prayers for the departed, 
Remembering especially Doug Beecham, Trudy Morris, and Robert Radner, father of Becky Johnson. Pray for those who have died and for those who mourn. <coughs> Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own way. O holy and loving God, accept the fervent prayers of your people in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Continuing in prayer, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <coughs> God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world that you have created. We repent of the evil that has slain us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of our Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers, let us stand together. Dear ones, the peace of the Lord, the peace of Christ be always with you. Feel free to greet one another with a sign of peace. And here come the kids. Hey, kiddos. And kids, you're going to your parents. So the good news is, the great news is that we were delighted to welcome Jack the donkey and Little Bit the pony, which is wonderful. Um, but in the interest of our time and flowing the liturgy, we're going to allow the Jack the donkey and Little Bit the pony to be our children's sermon before the service. So we're going to continue on. So you may be seated. We'll have some announcements for the community. I want to make sure I extend a... A, a, a expansive welcome. This is a welcoming and inclusive congregation, and we're delighted to be sharing life and love with all who are here and all who are gathered here, but who might be gathering online. Let's turn around and wave if you're in the center aisle. Turn around and wave and say, hello, friends, hello, neighbors. It's good to be here. Um, we do have an online community um, that really does stay connected, and it's a delight that we can continue to do that. Thank you to our technical team that makes that happen. And you'll be working a bit this week, tech team, um, so thank you for that. 
Uh, there is a lot to say about life in the community and in the parish. Um, and please know that you are welcome to all um, of the liturgies that unfold this week at All Saints. Um, and I want to extend, um, before I get there, before we get there, a word of gratitude to all who make this wonderful life of celebration and love possible. Um, the work of public liturgy is transformative, uh, and it is transformative because many people give their lives into it. So there are ushers, and there are writers, and there are people in communications, and there are people serving uh, as chalice bearers. There are people who are organizing those who serve as chalice bearers. There are people who are carrying things, and people who are putting things down, and people who are making things go inside of other things. Um, there's just a lot of stuff to get done. And there are musical, incredible musicians and singers, but then there are people who plan what the musicians and singers are going to do. It's a lot. So for anybody who is involved in the remotest way in making sure all of these liturgies happen this week, um, and that they are the, the transformative um, instruments of hope and resurrection that they might be, let's give everybody a word of thanks. Let's do that. Thank you so much. There's, there's just, it's incredible. Uh, we have our, our vestry member here today, Fran, is here with some more words about the parish um, and about the schedule that is it's unfolding this week. Thank you, Fran. Good morning. Um, I'm glad to be here representing your vestry. Uh, just a few things to share with you. Uh, today marks the beginning of the journey of Holy Week, and thank you very much to those who made the crosses. We really appreciate that. Uh, this week, there's going to be Holy Communion on Monday through Wednesday at 12.30, and Monday Thursday service will begin at 6 p.m. Uh, a labyrinth walk will be held on Good Friday from 3 to 6 with a service and communion following, and then uh, Easter next Sunday will begin with a sunrise service at 7 a.m. and an Easter egg hunt at 10 with another celebration and the flowering of the cross at 10.30. Donations of plastic eggs filled with individually wrapped toys or treats are still needed for the Easter egg hunt, so if you can help, please bring them by this Thursday. Uh, volunteers are also needed to help set out the eggs at 9.30 and host for the hunt at 10 next week. So if you can help, please email children at allsaints-cc.org. Today, well, today is technically the last day to order your Easter, Easter lilies, but I was told that if you get them in by tomorrow, they'll sneak you in. So um, they are $20 each, and there should be forms around the church and in the pews for you to fill out, and you're welcome to either give that to um, an office volunteer or put it in the offering plate. And you can also pay online, by the way. Um, All Saints will be organizing and staffing a new indoor food pantry the fourth Tuesday of every month at the Fish Pond Living Apartments on Buford. Volunteers are needed for that, and if you're interested, please contact Allison Witt. There's a lot of activities going on. I just kind of scratched the surface. Uh, so please check out the church newsletter and uh, the website at www.allsaints-cc.org for more information. Thank you and have a great Sunday. As we come to this table of nourishment and transformation, let us walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
One of the ways that we can give offering is by offering our gratitude. Let's say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. All things come of thee, O Lord. And now thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, renewed by word and sacrament, they may come to the fullness of grace, which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels, and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepare the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of old. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on a cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and of life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his friends, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and your sons, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor and glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time we try to deliver us. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We are the men of one body, for we all share in one bread. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. God's holy food for God's holy people. Taste and see that Christ is good.
Our prayer following communion is in your service bulletin. Let us stand together as we pray this prayer together. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life, life cup of salvation. salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another. another. And you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, Spirit, rest upon you this day, remain with you always, give you great joy, light, love, and hope forever. Amen. Amen. As we go into Jerusalem, we sing a hymn about going into Jerusalem. Our closing hymn is Into Jerusalem, Jesus Road. It's in your service bulletin. Let us sing together. Thanks be to God.